It is my pleasure to give you feedback on the UK Learning October 2013 conference at the Royal Institute of British Architects in London. The theme of the conference was A Revolution in Environments for Learning. The conference was attended by national and international speakers. Um, UK Learning is, is part of that, and the reason that UK Learning chose the name UK Learning was because we felt that the UK needs to share and exchange information about some of the issues in terms of environments for learning and bringing professionals together to try to make that work and to try to get a new angle on how we can achieve that and how we can go forward in that process. Um, really, what we're trying to do is to try and find a way of looking at environments for learning within the context of current funding constraints. Because at the moment, all of us as professionals, I guess, feel that there's a challenge about how we can get real value out of those that are <coughs> available to improve learning opportunities for young people within schools. I think it's a real challenge, it's hard. And the head teachers I've been talking to over the last year have actually been saying that, in a way, there's no debate about the sorts of things that they can use to help them to improve the opportunities for young people within their schools. Either it comes like an express train, it's suddenly a building program, or actually, how can we start to engage students and teachers into using spaces differently? And how can we get over some of the challenges that are placed in front of us? At the conference, Reba was represented by Nigel Austin, who focused on renewed client engagements in promoting a more collaborative approach, post-occupancy evaluation, and whole school life planning. Yeah. Um, my name is Nigel Austin. Uh, I'm an architect. I'm quite good in architecture. Um, but in terms of the RIDA, I sit on the Tax and Profession Committee eh? because there are some common aims between uh, between UK learning and, and the RIDA. And that fundamentally comes from what the RIDA is looking to do over the next couple of years under our new president, Stephen Hodder's tenure, uh, which we're calling for clients as a heading. And there are there are three um, sort of broad aims of that. Um, one is is a straightforward improving the um, client services that the RBA provides, and there are many of those. Uh, some are done well, some are done better. Um, but I think the others are interesting. One is um, to research and provide evidence on the value um, of architecture and what architects can do. And I think that seems to me like it's, it's very direct related to what we're doing here. Um, and the other, which is the part I'm involved in through the client liaison group, is to uh, is to research clients' needs. And again, I think this is um, this is directly relevant. We want to understand better about what, what it is the clients want and feed that back back to the membership here. Caroline Buckingham, a lead member, focused on the creative remodeling of learning environments within current budgetary constraints. Um. Slightly, well, first of all, thanks Terry and Neil for what you're trying to do with UK Learning because um, when they first spoke, spoke to me about it, and I think I'm pragmatic and I've gone around for the last two years with all of our heads down, we've been trying to win the work, get on with the work, and we're saying, um, actually, do you know what? I don't want to sit in any more conferences about standardisation or how we can't talk about transformation or all these things we learned about through BSF, which is now going to work. But the fact is, there's loads of us here who have got loads of expertise, loads of really good um, experience. And actually what we need to do is use that and bring the profession back up and lead from the front. So that's why, thank you for what you're doing, because I really believe we can get that power behind us and sort of move forward. Uh, you know, we do have a voice, and, and thanks to the RIPA supporting it. Uh, to me, and to hope with the other architects, it's, it's extremely important for our profession. From everything that um, Terry's been through there, actually collaboration, creativity and communication, listening to your client, I mean, is what's really important. I suppose my slide is beautiful primary school in London, uh, wants to demonstrate that actually maybe it's quite hard to do things in a really large, you know, massive way. We're not going to build 30 million pounds, 20 million pounds, 5 million pounds schools anymore. What could we do that makes the most impact in a little way to really sort of bring um, those aspects and communication with what we've got to offer as a, as a load of design professionals. How can we improve that quality of space? So, I don't know. Murray Johnson from the Department of Education reminded us of the current economic challenges that we face. 
but encouraged us to think about where we needed to move to rather than where we are. So as Neil said, I'm, my name is Mari Johnson. At the moment, I'm the design lead for the Department for Education. And I've been in that role for about five years now. So uh, we've seen governments come and go and uh, challenges also wax and wane. Um, I'm an architect by profession. And I worked as an architect for about 10 years till I was in my early 30s. And uh, then I had a bit of a change of direction. And I went to uh, work for my first government agency, uh, which was the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment. And the purpose of that one was to try and see if we were spending public money on new buildings, what could we do in order to make sure that we got the best result out at the end. So I worked there for about six years and then moved into schools from there to say, OK, well, here's the environment as a whole. So how do we actually take those lessons and take them to education? Actually, by then, I wasn't a school's architect myself initially, um, but I found school environments a really rewarding um, area to step into because the variety of things that go on in a school building is pretty much greater than any other kind of environment at all and all the lessons that we'd learn on sort of urban planning master planning residential that had come in the, the five years of us at the commission for architecture actually all applied in a school setting and um, i was always quite mindful that you know in our society at the moment kids have to go to school so they're kind of stuck in there and they're going to be there for 12 years so actually we've got a you know, a bit of a duty to try and make that a pleasant and uh, you know, enriching experience. So it felt like a very worthwhile really thing to do. Uh, but then I'm, I'm really interested to hear from you what experiences you've had about trying to build a new school in a new settlement, <coughs> I, either in this country or abroad, because I know in Europe they've done probably more of that than we have. But it's something we need to be you know, gearing up about to some extent, I would say, in, in the coming years. So uh, what we were saying earlier about you know, let's move to where the ball's going to be rather than where it is, this might be something that we need to be anticipating. Stephen Harris, Head Teacher of the Year for the last two years in Australia, focused on empowering students, teachers and or design professionals to work collaboratively to develop an agenda for future learning. He illustrated how he has taken his fundamental principles and beliefs as a head teacher and translated them into the evolving design, remodelling and organisation of the Northern Beaches Christian School. Now, the, um, the Australian government's response to the global financial crisis was to give every school $3 million. Uh, in the non-government sector, we were able to spend it ourselves. Now, embarrassingly, in the New South Wales government sector, 60% of that money got spent on administration, so only 40% got spent on builds. Um, in our case, we spent $3 million on a building. And to meet the guidelines, we, we, we um, built a sports centre. Um, we were told that the federal government was going to change the regulations for building. We no longer had to go through council. We had, an, sorry, we had an 18 month window of opportunity to not submit anything to the local council and we could go five metres higher and we could go closer to the fence. So I went straight to the architect the next day and said, OK, we go, <laughs> I want a building that's now 12 metres high. It's going to be five metres from that fence. We were able Let's to go out and do this. Now underneath the space, because we could go five metres up at this lower level here, we got a complete empty floor. Now rather than fill that out in the first instance, I knew that my design and technology teachers would have built four classrooms at the time if I'd actually said to them, what do you want? It needs to be viewed in multiple ways beyond sharing curriculum. It has to be the sharing of space and getting your head around that one. We actually didn't buy any furniture for the space either. I just simply walked around the school to other areas where we'd have plenty of furniture and thought, OK, we'll just take those, we'll take those, we'll take those, we'll bring it together. And then it was enhanced by some of our ground staff who found our old whiteboards from underneath the building and said, we can turn those into tables. And again, we started to do that. And it's a, it's a highly flexible area. It's probably the, the room that most secondary students most love because it's like a large lounge room. Um, not only do I space, our, our sprung floor stage has a, uh, has a mirrored retractable wall and then a side section there which we can completely blacken out for a performance but in the meantime every day it's our drama studio and our dance studio and, uh, and it's quite a nice space and it, it also um, ironically means that there's no garbage dump of stuff on the stage. I mean, how many stages in schools do you go to where very quickly they become the storeroom that no one can see? Um, we also then explored uh, outside. Now, in the Australian context, grass wouldn't grow, so that's synthetic. 
but the idea of saying rather than having tables, what would happen if we built little fake hills? Those hills are jumped on, sat on, guitars played on, read, whatever else happens every every second of the day going through, and it's it's actually cheaper than than outdoor furniture when you we did it, and it was interesting when we went, went to build it. The um, guy came out to do it for us and he said, where were the plans? And I said, it's in my head and in your hand. <laughs> I said, I want two little hills, not so high that someone's going to fall over them, um, large enough so that you can get about 30 kids sitting on them. And then he built those. We've got them primary and secondary. We also played, thought, okay, what about the existing spaces where we don't want to, we can't change the walls or anything else? Um, again, we started playing with furniture design. Now, the interesting thing is that the chairs here which replaced a desk, a chair and a locker were designed by one of our students and then we had them commercially produced so that they are extremely comfortable and functional because you can just sort of throw your bag in, inside them. Um, some other students now have actually started to explore in a project that we have with Year 11, they've got to create robust furniture, strong enough for someone like me to sit down and to, to move around. It has to cost less than $5 per piece, so that means you're restricted to two pieces of cardboard and you can't use glue or sticky tape. So you've actually got to do it entirely through structural robust strength and they've actually created multiple designs that work around and we're going to get some of those commercially produced because they're so effective. That came from students. Michael Olif, a lead member, provided practical examples of innovative spaces for learning, both in schools and the workplace. You know, looking at schemes like this, um, you know, no one would argue that you know, that space at Elm Green um, sort of doesn't add to the student experience. You know, that space there um, is used for assemblies, whole school assemblies, performances, um, exhibitions. If you go on YouTube, you can see them doing a gangland style presentation. <laughs> the head teacher doing that, embarrassing. Um, but they've even held sort of First World War battle reenactments in that kind of space. So it is a credibly um, impressive sort of learning environment. Mm -hmm. um, John Wilkinson, head teacher, um, attributes the, the design um, with an 80% reduction in antisocial behaviour and a 70% drop in absenteeism. So you start to then link those spaces actually have a measurable benefit. Um, so the question here is, how can we deliver these spaces um, still within the constraints that we're now operating within? Because we can't change the constraints. It's not about sort of trying to rewrite the rule.